What's going on, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 754, with today's guest, Sifu Elvis Stoiko. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host here for the show, founder of Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts and traditional martial artists. Check out whistlekick.com for all the things that we're doing to support you, and check out our store using the code PODCAST15 to save 15%. The show gets its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com because there's so much going on. We bring you two episodes each and every week, all under the heading of connecting, educating, and entertaining traditional martial artists. If that is a value to you, if you appreciate the work that we do, please consider supporting us. You can share this episode with somebody. You could sign up for our newsletter or maybe join our Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. You can get in for as little as two bucks a month. We got tiers that go up from there and we just deliver overwhelming value to you. If you like the show, if you like what we do, you're going to love what we do with Patreon. For those of you who support our Patreon, thank you. Too many to name. I appreciate every contribution, whether it's two bucks or it's more. It means a lot. Today's guest is a name you may or may not know. I was very familiar with him. And years ago, when we started this process, I was surprised to learn he was a martial artist which shouldn't have been a surprise because he did something that was kind of a big deal that um, martial artists kind of liked. But the thing that he was really known for at the time, people didn't really like. And I love that. Okay. And through this process, I've been reminded, I was, I was younger, this, we're, we're going back decades. But getting the chance to talk to him and hearing yet another example of how martial arts has given someone a platform to do amazing things. It's one of my favorite things to hear about. So let's hear about this one. Hello, hello. Hello, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm glad we're getting to do this. Yeah, I know. It's been a little while, huh? (laughs) Hey, you're not the person that's taken the longest. We've had others that it just, you know? You go, you come back, you know, sometimes things take take time. It's all right. Yeah. Oh, good. Good, good, good. I was glad to get your email though. Perfect. No, this is great. This is something that has been on my list to get uh to get done and and do because um yeah, it was just something with the martial arts stuff. It's been um I get some of them once in a while. It's mostly skating stuff. So right. it was something that was on my list that I wanted to get uh to do. And so I'm glad it worked out. Me too. Me too. Well, uh uh at risk of of foreshadowing, folks like you who are known for a thing are often ignored for what martial arts did to help them do that thing or get to that point or, you know, physical or emotional, like whatever the, those tools coming out of the toolbox were. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Right on. Very good. Awesome. Well, if if you're good, let's just, let's just roll. Yeah, we can do okay. it. Yeah, let's do it. Right. yep. Absolutely. Um, which came first, skating or martial arts? <laughs> skating started first. Okay. I was um, around four and a half years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, and my parents, um, both in, in the arts, my mom, my mom was a dancer and my dad, my dad sang. So okay. uh, when they came in the 50s, that's, uh, I mean, Elvis Presley was, was big, so I ended up yeah. getting his name. Um, <laughs> I wanted to skate since I was really little, but I had, I had other interests too. Uh, into motorsports and things like that, but the what they put me in was skating, and I I took to it pretty quick. And, and the martial arts came later. Um, when I was around ten years old, my dad uh, saw one of the skaters uh, on TV competing from the states. I think it was Christopher Bowman who had done, I guess, some kickboxing or something like that. And my dad thought it was a good idea for me to to get into that. Plus, I was a small kid. I was mm-hmm. in figure skating in a country that hockey was the predominant right. thing this was back in the back in the eighties too, right? So yeah. it was a little bit different perception. And I started doing martial arts. I started with I started with karate first. Mm-hmm. And let's see, I don't, I'm not even sure the question I'm trying to ask it. Four and a half is young to put a kid into any kind of physical discipline, right? Like whether we're talking about martial arts or skating or horseback riding, like most four or five-year-olds struggle to stand up consistently. You know, they're falling over. How involved was skating at that point? 
that's a great question because back then like every kid is the, the kids are into a lot of different things mm -hmm. and i was into so many different things but um something my parents loved they loved figure skating uh and I I took to it because I loved being on the ice and I loved exploring and playing. It's like, it's like the inner the inner child at the time. I was the child, so you just explore and you play. And by the time I was six, I started doing sort of the club competition scene in okay. Newmarket. That's where I that's where I started skating in Newmarket. Mm -hmm. And it, it you know you, you don't start out like gung ho like you're gonna go to the Olympics right away. You 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 introduce yourself to it. You don't even know if you know, I guess my parents are like, you don't even know if he's going to really like it or where it's going to go. Um, but I was just so focused. I've always been like that. No matter what, whatever I choose to do, um, I put 100% into it. And a lot of people say, oh, this, you're so good at different things. And I'm like, no, it's the things I choose, I focus on. And I like getting good at those things. There's lots of yeah. stuff I'm not good at at all. And I don't even try to like, do them because I it's just not my thing but sure. there's certain things in my life that I that um, I enjoy and and skating was um, you know just like anyone it starts starts off kind of slow and by the time I was I think it was around eight or nine the coach I was working with in new market said that you know I had talent and I had focus and drive and and uh, I should be in an environment that had better skaters to go mm -hmm. from sort of you know recreation club level stuff to like a bigger club yeah. so we decided to go to the toronto cricket skating and curling club which had at the time was the mecca in canada with with so many great skaters on the national team and mm. and and i started training with uh, mrs ellen burka who was a legend uh she taught her daughter um was a world champion she taught taller cranston which most most skating fans know who was um was an innovator himself and mm -hmm. i i that's when things started really moving when I, when it was like the training of it, they, sh Ellen was, Mrs. Burka was just showing me how to, if you want to make it, this is what you need to do. Mm -hmm. And for those, those development years from the age of nine till about 13, when I worked with her there, um, my skating went from here to here. And then after that is when I started working with Doug Lee, who taught Brian Orser and uh that's when everything started really peaking out and and the drive but it was the, it was really the commitment at that point when you go from kind of playing rec to like when you make the decision to really go for it um and um it's it's that was a it was a whole family decision too because it, it, yeah it's an individual sport but you need that you need that whole teamwork my, both my parents my mom took me to and from the rink, to and from school. I did my homework in, in the car. I ate in yeah. the car. It was like, you know, it started, it, it, that was when it really took off. And and my skating, when I committed that to that fully, uh, my life changed. Hmm. Now, when we think about a kid at that age, you know, we, we often here in the States, you know, soccer or football or basketball are the sports where you see a kid going from league to league to league and the parents are, you know, doing exactly what you're talking about. They're, they're transporting, they're feeding. But quite often there's this perception that it's the parent driving that. Mm -hmm. How much of what was going on for you at eight, nine, 10 years old was really you understanding what this entailed and how much was your, your parents kind of pushing? Yeah, that, no, that's a great question because there, there, there's a very fine balance in that. Um, sure. You know, I, I'm sure my mom went through it and my dad went through it and people say you know are you you know i was at the rink back in the day for us when we did compulsory figures um and and free skate i was at the rink six i was on the ice six hours a day hmm. i'd be on the ice at 5 30 in the morning i had to get up at 3 30 um and it was you know hours before school i'd get to school slightly late i went to a private school that kind of helped with my scheduling i finished school my mom picked me up i'm back at the rink again hmm. so it, it, you know that that type of thing it's like gymnastics you have to be on it. It, it it's a different type of sport it's most skills are perishable i call them perishable skills mm -hmm. but skating is one of those things that if you take just a few days off the feeling goes it's it's a very interesting yeah it's a very sensitive thing like when i go car racing or doing the car stuff 
if I'm away from it for a little bit, I can come back in a couple sessions and I can get back in the groove. Skating that feeling, it it it's it's really tough to 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 get back. And it it looks like you're you know the kids are being pounded because you're constantly on the ice, but it's like gymnastics. It's just it's it's hard on the body. Number mm-hmm. one, it takes hours, painstaking hours of trial and error of just constantly doing it. And my parents. Um, they supported me, but it was really, really my decision. And, and I, a lot of times my mom had, like, I was usually the first one on the ice and the last one off the Zamboni would be on the ice and I'd still be trying to squeeze in my last jump. Okay. Uh, and the Zamboni guy's like, okay. And I'm like, give me one more jump. He's like, all right. He knew that I was trying to like every session counted. And it, it was, I was so driven. Um, and it's like that in anything I, I love, I've always been driven and I, and I, overdo it all my injuries were mostly mostly my injuries were overtraining injuries and um if anything uh, there were times where I was really low that my my parents pushed me and they said look if you really want to do this and you want to go to the olympics and you want to win olympics and you want to be a world champion this is what you have to do and they were very they were an older generation they were they were born in the in the 30s hmm. and so they're their perception of life and success is like it's very black and white you work at it and you succeed and you put everything you can into it um and I love that because it was simple in my mind and 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 once in a while you know there was my mom being very strong and stubborn like me we would we would butt heads a lot um I always laugh because she was a Taurus and I was an Aries and we we butt butt heads uh, many times on a lot of things but it made me tough as nails. It made me strong. Mm-hmm. Um, it was hard. It was hard at times for sure. It's not an easy thing, but um, I, most of it, most of that inspiration that has to come, it comes from the athlete. Like for me, it was my inner, inner thing. There's nothing my mom could make me do that. I didn't want to do and, or my dad. So it was really, I just, I just went with it. And, and no matter what it was, um, you know, I just, I, I went full, full, full beans uh, with it. And there are times, yeah, I've seen skaters that were burned out and skating moms and, or like we say, hockey dads or skating moms, you yeah. know, yeah. I'm just using that as sort of a template, but um, uh, they, the kids have lots of talent and the parents are like, oh my gosh, we got a talented kid. We got to, you know, and then you hear a lot of people talk, oh, you should do this or you should do that with your kid. And oh yeah, you put him there. And then they go in and then they just push them and push them and push them and push them. And really the kids like they're doing it, but they're not, the heart isn't there and, or there is, but then they get burned out at a very young age. They peak too early. And, and that's something I was lucky. I didn't peak too early. And, um, you know, I would, I, I did really well at a young age, but I peaked right at the right time. And it's just, it's, it's a, it's a very intricate balance. And I think, um, with parents that have wanted to do something in their lives and may not have succeeded the way they wanted. And then they live through their child, which is great in one way because they're sharing their passion through the the child. But when it becomes their own thing, then that's where it gets lost. And, and it's really the child wants to go their own path. And, and it's a, it's, it's hard. It's really, really hard to, to differentiate and pull that apart uh, for the parent because they they want they want their child to succeed and and it's them it's part of them so mm-hmm. it's it, again it's a very it's a very intricate balance um you know it's never my parents we we weren't perfect doing it they like i said there were moments where it's really hard um and we fought and but at that level you fight it's just it's just the 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 stress level of it all and the amount of energy put in people say hey wh- who are your sponsors my dad was my sponsor right up I didn't get sponsors until I actually won worlds. I was second and third in the world and didn't get anything really small little things, but nothing. I I didn't start getting anything back until I actually became world champion, believe it or not. So my dad who had worked, you know, every day, hard, hard as anything as a landscaper, Mm. um, it it was, you know, blue, blue collar job. And, but he come to some competitions. It was, you know, it was a, it was a team effort uh, for us to make it work. And yeah, it was stressful, but um, the balance was pretty good, I'd say, and and I turned out okay uh, in the end. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. 
you talked about the dedication as a kid. Yeah, I think you, you phrased it. There was nothing your parents could make you do that you didn't already want to do. Mm -hmm. Was that dedication from a love of the process or from being able to identify goals at an early age? The, the, the number one, um, I was very, very focused right off the top. No matter what I did, I was very focused. Okay. I was very goal orientated. Um, and the focus stuff will come into when, when we get more into the martial arts section of it, which was something my, my Sifu knew right away um, and harness that. But the goal, the goal setting for me at a young age, I would, you know, whether it was a small goal that I wanted to get a jump or a skill or something, I would be on it like a dog with a bone mm. until I actually mastered it. And then, I, then I'd be like, oh, my God. And then I'd go on to something else. And for me, it was all about um, attaining what I could attain on the physical realm or that sensation or feeling uh, of achievement. And for me, I, I, I loved doing that with whatever I loved doing. That was the main focus. Um, you know, later on, you get caught up in all the hype of the medals and all of this stuff, which everyone does at some point. Uh, but that wasn't the main focus. And I know most kids at the very beginning, it's not their main focus. But right. as you go through and you see yourself in the bigger picture in the world, your perception of you and your relationship to the things around you are like, wow, okay. Um, there's so many things out there and you can get, you can lose yourself in that. And so it's, it's very important that um, that particular goal setting for yourself, personal, not, not something externally put in uh, it, it is very, very important because a true drive or true inspiration can only come from within. It can't be an external source. And because it, 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 that's only temporary, it can be something from the outside. Um, there's moments where an external thing can um, relight a fire if you've lost a little bit of, or, or if, you've, if, you're, if your flame has dimmed. Mm. So for example, people would say, oh, he, he can't do it, or he's washed up, or, or he'll never make it. Those, I always loved those because that fueled me. I'd be the first one to stand up. As soon as it can't be done, I'd be like, okay. And I'd stand up because I, I proved I wanted to prove that it could be done. So that inspiration um, helped me once in a while. So you can use those at times, but the true flame, you, for me, I had to learn what exactly made me tick and I had to learn and, and, and know, know myself when I, when I give classes, whether I'm teaching acting, whether I'm teaching skating, hockey, martial arts, the big thing is about um, know thyself. It's just like in the matrix when Neo walks in and he meets the Oracle and she says, you know, it's written in Latin when he walks in above the, above the kitchen, mm -hmm. uh, entryway. And it says, know thyself. That to me is what, um, is all about sport it, it, because you, you start to discover who you are through the physical action of trial and error. And I still say fail or not achieve. I, and we have to learn that. I don't, I don't believe in, oh, everybody's a winner and everyone is successful all the time. I'm like, no, you have to, you have to take the hits and the failures to understand, take a step back and go, oh, and then move forward. If you look at it in a, in a, in a healthy way, um, sorry, I'm answering so much there for you. Uh, and, I, I appreciate it. This, is, uh, this uh, is what we do on this show. I, I ask a question and I get 46 answers to other questions and that's the best part. And then I see you writing it, you get some, get some more questions along the way, but that, that really in everything I've done in my life, it's been that way, a goal, mm -hmm. there's the goal setting, uh, clarity of the goal, um, clarity of my intent. And then there's the commitment towards it and the enjoyment of the self-discovery mm -hmm. as you're, as you're going through the process. And I love the process. And again, going, going back to that, the process of it is just amazing. And, and uh, um, it's, I, I love that you have those aha moments where you discover things about yourself and what you're doing. Sure. But you said 10 was when you got into karate. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I was okay. around nine or 10. Yeah. Yeah. Did you, I, I'm, I'm getting the sense, you know, from learning a bit about your personality that if you stepped into martial arts, it was because you wanted to. Did you want to for its own reasons or because of its, you saw some support of your skating? Uh, it was something my dad, um, he exposed me to it. Mm -hmm. I was interested in it. Um, 
and uh, they're, they're the three the three main things in my life to go back was skating and then dirt biking when I was seven. I loved motorsports, <laughs> and then the martial arts was ten. My parents weren't huge on it. Uh, they gave me the dirt bike as sort of something on the side, which I'll get to later, because mm-hmm. that grew into something which I realized was my main passion, um, which I'm doing now. But the martial arts was something that I I I really I had an interest for. So my dad took me to um, just a local club. And I started doing karate and learning from there. And uh, he, he thought it would be great for power and, and explosion and, and stretching and flexibility and all of that. And it did. And it helped, it helped quite a bit. And, uh, and then through that, the, I realized that certain styles catered better for skating. And, mm-hmm. and I didn't really know it until I met my, my, my Sifu. Uh, back when I was about 16, I already got a black belt in karate. And I felt, I guess some people will notice this in some clubs, they get to a certain level and then it kind of tapers off. Mm-hmm. You start teaching more classes and then you're not advancing. And I knew there was something missing mm-hmm. and I needed more. And when I started working with, um, with Glenn, uh, Glenn Doyle, my Sifu, uh, I met through my brother, everything changed. Mm-hmm. I had, to, I had a base platform to work from and, uh, the fluidity of the Kung Fu uh, and the explosion of it and the movement of it worked so well with skating that it just, it, it blended so well. And that, and that, uh, I would, that went from there, but since as far back as I can remember, I was always interested in the in martial arts and it was more mystic back then in the seventies and eighties. It wasn't yeah. huge, like, you know, with the mixed martial arts and all this stuff that's happening now. Um, it was like, Ooh, martial arts. It was like, kind of that spoken thing oh there's only a few clubs out there and and um it was a little it was a little bit of different time but uh i i enjoyed it i loved it it was uh, a way for me to focus uh learn focus power explosion um sense of self all all of these different aspects of it which you know a lot of people talk about in the martial arts yeah uh, when did you have time <laughs> when did you have time to train karate and, and kung fu um, I know, I know. It was, um, it was spaced out because I mean, when I was younger, um, we like bef- before I was ten, skating was sort of, sort of being implemented in, and then by the time around nine, nine years old, it cooked in. So there were certain times. I think I did classes twice a week, sometimes three times a week. So I believe there was Saturdays I went in for karate classes, um, and then also like either Tuesday or Wednesday, I went a couple times a week. Mm. Later on, when I moved from the karate to the Kung Fu, um, skating had removed the figures aspect of, of it. So I was able to cut out at least two hours of that particular two to three hours of that training. So I was, mm. in, I was able to implement the Kung Fu working with Glenn. Um, it wasn't about the quantity of time. It was about the quality. So, you know, there was a couple times a week we'd work together um, but it was like, you know, we do like two, three hours of very focused work and then relax for a bit. And that really worked well. Cause he, he, Glenn knows movement so well mm-hmm. and you had to blend it together and, and exactly what I needed it for. So it, it really, it really, uh, my skating just really took off. That's when I started focusing in, uh, on, the explosion aspect of the muscles and things like that in my skating that the quads I started doing quads consistently before a lot of people were doing them and I made I made the quad jumps um you know a mainstay in skating because of that and my yeah. ability to uh, perform it under pressure and perform under pressure on a regular basis was due to that uh due to that confidence and that understanding of the body and the focus and body awareness hmm was now we, we had Glenn Doyle on episode I, I looked it up while you were talking 360 mm-hmm. if if we were to bring him back for for a quick bit and if I asked him were you teaching you Elvis Stoiko as the same way you would teach anyone else or was he giving you different stuff because you had this other very significant pursuit in your life I, it would it would be different Okay. Um, it, the way I watched Glenn teach for many years and, uh, and, and with his methods, whether he was working with an equestrian rider, a tennis player, a hockey player, a figure skater, um, uh, he could apply what was needed for the individual. 
because everyone's different. So for me, I had, uh, I had, I'm very, I'm built very much like him. So I was able to pick up on things like type two muscles. I have very quick twitch type two muscles, but my limit is not being able to sustain endurance longer. And my, this is the way my body was built. So mm -hmm. I'm, you know, skating was tough because the two, two and a half minute program for the short program, you can get through. But when you go to the four and a half minute program, it's like a, it would say like a 1500 meter cross country run where mm. you're, you're anaerobic and aerobic at this, you're doing, you know, anaerobic activity over aerobic period of time where you're just like, Oh, you know, it's like gymnastics to do a floor routine, but they're getting right to the point where it gets, you know, aerobic and then they stop. So that explosion, but in skating, you're, you're, oh my God, your, your heart rate's a buck 80, buck mm. 70. You gotta, you gotta work through that. And so there was very specific things that we worked on. Um, you know, my hip wouldn't fire on the left side properly or, um, the way I would perceive, uh, you know, preparing when I was, when I was working on something and my mindset was you know, looking one way and he was able to bring it back and look at the other way. And it's very personal. So each person or, or, or team, uh, he would work with, there was individual things he would do for them. And that, that was such an advantage, uh, for that. So he would work with everybody differently. And even if I was, you know, having a class or we're working together with another skater or someone else, and we're doing a class, we'd work together, but then there were certain, things that he would give to us for individual stuff that he would see that was different. That's he had such a, he has such a keen eye for that. And I mm -hmm. was able to pick it up movement wise, even when I'm teaching acting, seeing energy blockage, you know, in an actor that's trying to, um, you know, uh, stay relaxed within the scene, I can see the movement and people are like, well, they're not moving. I'm like, yeah, there's movement. There's a blockage and that's a sensitivity. You, and I, it was amazing. I started picking it up the same way. Uh, and it was, uh, it just shows the, the incredible teaching, um, ability that Glenn, Glenn has. And it was, it was, uh, I used it in everything. Oh, cool. Right on. It, it sounds like he was a pretty significant piece of your success. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Massive, massive. massive. Yeah, okay. yeah, massive. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, yeah. And I, people ask, you know, um, I jump in the cars and racing go-karts and, you know, being second and third in Canada and then making the world team and, and all of that over a short <laughs> period of time. And people are like, how are you doing that? I said, I just come through the crap out of everything. <laughs> I just come through everything. And it's just, and what, what I mean by that is just the, the mental set of, of the clarity. And it's funny teaching acting, my, my acting instructor, um, Lewis Bowmander at the Bowmander school, um, very, very similar, uh, way of, of working with, um, a, a student uh, Glenn Glenn it's like I attracted all the the, the different teachers they're very similar Ener energy wise and and detail wise and very calm and so Lewis uh, who'd been teaching for over 45 yeah over 40 years mm -hmm. 45 years in the business taught you know Keanu Reeves and, and all these different like big name actors and and he said Elvis I want to do a course with you based on how you've learned so quickly in acting and i'm like uh, okay this is really cool so it, it allowed me uh, as glenn would say if you can teach it then you know it mm. if you can't teach it you don't know it so it, it's a great it was a great way for me to test that so i i went and uh we just started doing this course recently and it's been phenomenal i've been learning so much working with the act and these some of these act, actors are actually they're they're working actors they're not beginners and it's been it's been phenomenal and i and i he asked you know lewis asked me how do you do it i said well in a nutshell like kung fu it and i go back to the kung fu but i also go back to the skating and the skating i've picked up so many wonderful things for coaches i've worked uh, Doug Lee was, you know, legend in, in it. He worked with Brian Orser and many international skaters over the mm -hmm. years. Incredible at competition. For example, going to a competition, um, the the biggest thing in a, in a tournament or competition, it's not what your coach says. It's what your co coach doesn't say. Mm -hmm. To keep quiet when they need to keep quiet. There should not be a lot of talk. It's just, how are you feeling? Good. What level are you at? About, a, about an eight or nine. I need to be about a six. Oh, okay, cool. And then you get, he, it's just there to want to prepare and the support. It's like, it's being able to just hold space for the athlete so that they can do their thing. You know, that's, the, that's their job there. And then the training at home is different. So I've had incredible mentors, incredible coaching. 
uh, throughout the years. And um, it's, I've just been blessed because uh, I, I think it's something to be said to, to manifest what you want. And I really believe in that. And if you send out um, the direction you want to go and your goals are very, very clear, you're going to attract the things you want in your life. Hmm. Well said. You know, you're, you're talking about, and, and I want to get into acting here in a moment because it's something I didn't know at all about you. It almost sounds like, I don't know, I don't know racing. I don't know motorsports well enough to say this, but certainly I know martial arts. I know forms. I know what pre presenting forms at a high level looks like and feels like. Figure skating feels like it's a similar mindset. You're using your body. It's a routine. You're trying to peak at the right time and perform and put yourself into the routine. I suspect acting is very similar. You're, you're digging out of yourself to convey something, but in this case, it's, it's on camera or on stage. Yes. So, um, where can I tie it all together? So skating, you're creating, you're taking a skill set that's already there, taking certain skills that are already there. Mm -hmm. Um, like a punch or a kick that's a standard, you know, a hook kick, uh, crescent kick, straight punch, whatever. You have those sets of skills. And then um, in skating, we have our jumps, our spins, our, and all of that skill set. Now, we're putting it together into a package that is created by you and your choreographer. So you're putting that package. So it's something no one's seen before, and it's not a, not a, a set routine mm -hmm. where in – Martial arts, unless there, unless you have open comp, oh, the open open forms events, right, where you have they create their own form and they do it, or you have traditional, mm -hmm. which these, these forms have been around for you know so many years, and 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 have and have that, um, and in acting you have the creative process of the writer mm -hmm. bringing stuff to onto this page and then the actor has to interpret that and bring that out so there's two i did i did study a lot with that and as glenn being a writer as well and he wrote screen screenwriting i learned a lot because you have to dive in and you're reading this the scene and you have to interpret and see the vision of the writer so you honor the writer's work but then you have to bring your own personality and your own way about it to 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 extract it so as a martial artist yeah you have your set that you're doing your form that you're doing and it could be something that is the traditional one but you're bringing your own creativity to it your own your own ism or your own personality all of that to that skating is the same so it's all of this in line and what's important is that you all of these things have to be performed there's a training segment of it where you train it and then there's the performance segment when you're competing for it or in you know some people say we're not competing in acting and i'm like oh yes you are you're competing for a part so when you're going in to do an audition you are competing against a group of other individuals that want that part so you are competing but how do you do it without falling into the competition external i get pulled this is something i talked about before it's getting pulled into the external uh, aspect of the environment where you need to be internal and martial arts as we know is is so internal mm. and i use that internal kung fu aspect i applied that to skating and i applied it to the acting where acting you have your skill set you work on voice you you work on um the technique of speech you work on um character and understanding and thought and process and emotion and there's these skill sets and then once you get a vocabulary of skills, uh, punches, kicks, sweeps, all of these, you have, now you've got a really good vocabulary and now it's, it's flowing. It's, it's rolling off the, the tip of your tongue or, or, or it's, it, it becomes like butter and it moves. Now you can create. Now I've seen people that were amazing in training or in practice, but then when they have to do it under pressure, that's the key. And that's what I learned from, from working with Glenn is how to access that when you need it the most. So I applied that in each thing that I do. And it, there's this, the skating, the martial arts, the acting and the racing. Mm. So the racing as well has that, there's the, a skill set that's there and to be able to be able to, to be zoned in and focus on one point 
and it's very, you know, you're traveling at high speed and turn in. I, I use a lot of analogies when I'm teaching acting or vice versa. They all, they all jump around. I'm able to see the common ground between all four things that have been such a massive part of my life that make me who I am. And I, for me, there's, it's, it's like the common thread between all of it has to make sense to me. I have to see the big picture. They can't be separate things that I do. They're very different in some aspects physically. It, there's, mm -hmm. there's some physical attributes that are different, but there's lots that are the same. And I try to find the sameness through it all so that for me, the, the, the philosophy of it makes sense. And then I apply those things to life in general. So they, mm -hmm. it, it's all one. It's not something you do and it's not applied. It, I try to find what that common ground is to understand because then I'm understanding me. I'm understanding how I learn through those four things that I do. Understand how I fail, how I succeed, where my weaknesses, where my strengths are. They're all sh they all show up in these different things that I do. And doing that, I understand more about myself, which then I can apply, become better to experience and share. Right on. How do you teach that? How do you share that? I, I imagine there are people listening going, okay, I, I intellectually can wrap my head around what you're saying, but I don't feel it myself. I've never been taught this. How would you start teaching someone that, well, the last five minutes that you just talked about? <laughs> well, I'll share with you um, basically what, what Lewis, Lewis wanted me to teach in acting. He goes, Elvis, how can we, cause they, they use a lot of sports metaphors, mm -hmm. but in acting, but they never, no one's really done a course based on it. Okay. And he's worked with, he said he, he has like a, there, he has these, he's worked with so many people. He has these 12 people that he's worked with that have like, like there was a professional wrestler and, and there was a dancer and it's a figure skater and they're, oh, they're like, they're really high, like a, a personality. Like that's how I am with stuff. And he says, I want to, figure out how we can create a course. So we broke it down and uh, I said, well, it's really about awareness and it's the commitment to what you're doing. Hmm. Commitment. It's like, we'll have like, um, you know, sort of a come to Jesus moment with the, with the, with the actors. I said, you go to the States and it is very competitive there. And if you don't commit yourself here, you go down the States, you're going to get eaten. I said, you're not, you're not going to be able to, to, to achieve your goal because it's very, very competitive. So, it was like, I'm going to, I wanted to showcase to them the commitment it takes to become an Olympic level actor or mm -hmm. that, that what I, what I did to become the best in the world. And I used that mentality for acting. So we broke down um, into the stages of, of say getting an audition. So we'll use that in, as an example. So you get an audition, so you get it. What's your first reaction? Cause they'll get the audition and then they'll, they'll go in and they'll start working on it they'll have thoughts about the audition, mm -hmm. personal demons, fears, excitements, and then they just go in and, and, and work on it, but they're not really acknowledging fully what their self-talk is when they get the audition. So we make them aware. So, so we're going to give you the audition. We'll give you the, we give you the, the sides, the scene. Okay. How do you feel? That's mm -hmm. the first step. The next step is getting the audition. Boom. Next one is prepping the audition. Once you've done your prep, then you show up for the audition, whether it be on Zoom, live, or tape. Then you do the audition. Mm -hmm. And then you, this was a big one. And this is what I learned from Glenn. And I use this was the debrief after. Because that is so important. So these, the, the, this, these five stages, um, each person is going to have a slight different take on how they do each one that's where it's per that's where it's very personal but the debrief at the end is a very important one because if you've had a a moment where it didn't go the way you wanted to you really got to look and find out okay now what what caused this and go back and go was it the the moment that i did it or or was it before when I stepped, when I, when I showed up in the room and I was just about to step in, did I lose it? It's like skating. I step on the ice and I'm doing the six minute warm up. 
We do the six minute warm to compete. We step off the ice. Each skater goes on. And when, when you're in the back processing everything, you're just about to step on. You could lose it all right there mm. because you could be like, and I've, it's, it's, everything comes to a head. It's like the swimmers. They're all waiting in that one. They, they, they like Mark Tewksbury from Canada won gold. And he used to talk about the pressure of being all your competitors are tucked into this small room, this waiting room before you go out to compete. And you're just like, you could lose it there. Mm. You could like, if you don't say strong, because the, the it's just, it's such a pressure cooker. Yeah. So uh, there's an equestrian um, rider, a girl I work with, and the, the girl, she, she, she's on her horse and she's warming up before she goes out to do her, her run her jump run. And there's a moment between going from the one warm up ring to no man's land where you're waiting to when she goes to compete. And I say, this moment is the most important because you, you, you're now going from warm up to translate that energy of focus to go do your thing mm. and that's important acting's the same skating's the same martial arts the same you're in the back warming up you're all lined up and everybody has their order and just as you're stepping out to go you 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 um uh you go to salute the the judges you do your thing you could lose it right there everything can get lost in that in, in that if you don't stay in your in your zone so all of these steps uh, through the acting, there, there's moments where the demon, your fears come out. And the fears usually show up around when you show up to when you're just about to do it. Yeah. And then as you do it, you're like, and all the demons going in. If it starts going down the toilet, your brain starts going, oh my God, I'm having a nightmare. And then it just collapses in. Or you have a successful one. And the debrief is where you look at it all and go, okay, not only when it goes bad or the way you want you also have to debrief when it goes good because a lot of people go oh it was great this was awesome i had a great time boom and then they're on to the next thing and i'm like no 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 yeah but why why did it go great you've got and this is what i learned when glenn was we were working together was i remember it was a very particular day and he used to come up and watch me skate and he used to like analyze a lot of things and then um later on we talk about the session and he said, Ellis, where's your mind at when you're, because I got frustrated on, on a, it was a triple axle or something and I was having trouble with it. And I was trying to get the, the sensation, the feeling. And he said, I want you to try something next time you go out. Cause I was focused on the one that I didn't do. He says, no, focus on the one that you did. Well, the one that was right. I want you to go back and fig and, and really insert yourself in to understand the things that you did to make that feeling. So you're in, you're reinforcing the one that was correct yeah. it was it was tough at first but then when i switched it it was like oh so you start you start learning your strengths too why like okay why did that work then you do it and you're like this is the same on each jump i have a strength when i do this and then you then i apply them to all the other jumps that's how i apply my strengths to all the things i do mm -hmm. so when i say i kung fu everything i literally kung fu everything because that particular skill that he showed me i apply even even acting the, the kids they'll, they'll come out of the student be like they'll they'll do the audition in front of us so we do these mock auditions we give them the, give them the sides they go and do it and then uh they'll finish and then we'll be like okay talk tell us we don't give any feedback we let them go in their bodies and try to talk about what they just did instead of us trying to tell them how they did first. Yeah. Right. So they go in. So now they're very self-aware. Now they got to go back and go in and go, Oh, I got to be self-aware here. And that's just, you, you got to go in and you start piecing all the little pieces in there and the little uh, nervous system nuances that not, not, might not be lined up yet. And be like, oh, I kind of missed yeah. here, but this was good, or that wasn't good, and I messed up here. And then when I was at home, I was thinking about the prep, and ah, so the prep to now, you're at the mercy of your warm up. You're at the mercy of your prep. That was something I told Lewis, and he was like, oh, I love that saying. You're at the mercy of your prep when you're just about to do it, or your training, right? So your prep and your and your training, and all you're at the mercy of that. And then when you go to do it that's when you really got to know yourself because fear comes in failure and success. When I work with kids, I say, I asked them two questions at the very beginning. I said, what, what's your ultimate goal? Mm -hmm. Why are you doing this? What's your ultimate goal? And what are you afraid of? Mm -hmm. And I said, you don't have to answer both right now. What are you afraid of? 
And I can only take you as far as your fears will let me. That's a powerful statement. Because I, the fear, a lot of them won't share the fear. And then there's a blockage physically. And we've seen it working with kids. It's like, why they got this, but they can't get this. Why all of a sudden? And then, it, and then, you know, coach could get frustrated with it, but, it, and I'm like, no, 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 it, there's a fear there. What's the fear, fear mm-hmm. of success, fear of failure, fear of what people think, fear of letting someone down. There are many things that are in there. You understand your fear. You will understand the demon that's there. You remove that demon. Boom. The physical aspect starts to roll mm-hmm. and through the debrief. That's where you discover it. If you're really, if you can really see, and it takes years sometimes to figure out the clarity of it, to understand where you come from, your environment, your childhood, like your upbringing uh, from your family, the environment you were in, uh, siblings, the school, the, the, the people you're around, all of these things are factors with this. So I'm going off on a tangent, but this is all part of, of understanding oneself. So it's not simply, you know, I just do the physical action and that's it. There's a, there's a greater meaning to actually doing, doing it all. There's something you brought up that you you took a, a a phrase that I use and you explained it better than anybody has. That that phrase is the best. It's between the moves. It's the space between the moves that matters the most. I don't say it that often, so it's not rolling yeah. off the tongue. And that came from observing some of the best martial arts forms competitors. What make this person better than this person? It wasn't their punch. It wasn't their kick. It wasn't their stance. It was the space between the movements. And you're talking about that space being not just those milliseconds between techniques, but those spaces between what, what hit me was you talked about the equestrian from the practice ring to the competition ring, the space in between. And that's what I'm hearing. And so I, I'm I'm looking at this as, you know, a, a former competitor, but realizing how much clarity that's laying on the things that, that myself, my coach, who happened to be my mother the things that we were, we fell into innately over time as we found what worked, it was those spaces in between. It was the drive from home to the dojo. It was the drive to the hotel the night before from, you know, where were we getting breakfast? All these spaces in between the things that most of us identify, okay, it's the two minutes, the four and a half minutes, the whatever time you're out on the floor or the ice as being what matters when, yeah, that matters, but that is, what did you say? You're at the mercy of your prep. At the mercy of your prep. And they, and they talk about, um, and then music, my dad being a singer and, and I, and I dabbled in it as well. Mm. And they say that um, music is the pause between the notes. That's where I got it. Yeah. Yeah. That's where, that's where it comes from and mercy at your prep and the moments in between. And that is so important. And I, and I think going back to your question about, you know, parents and kids and the pushing and the, and dry, what's the driving force is what, what, I think made me successful is the fact that I did so many different things for skating. It was, I was involved in so many different things that allowed me to experience and skate about something. Because mm-hmm. if it's just only the one thing, it becomes very incestuous with it and you don't have anything to give to it as an artist. So to live life, I have something to offer into my skating, to perform in my acting in my Kung Fu, uh, even in my racing, there's, there's, there's a creativity of, it's not just simple. There's apex and there's the way you do it. It's the lift off throttle before going back on throttle, mm. you know, the moment be- between break and, and throttle where it's, it, it doesn't say coasting, but carrying speed. And then the moment the throttle comes back on those pauses, those moments, it's, it's when we're, when we're taking our breath, it's not about the breath in or the breath out. It's the peak when you were taking our breath in and there's a moment where it hangs and there's nothingness. Mm. And then it could, the breath comes all the way back in and there's a moment again, where it's nothingness. So those are, those are the ones, the living moments, right? That's, and that's, it's just water coming in and then water going out. And it's that that timing, those moments is what's the is the timing that sets the movement. Mm. 
So, and, and, that, and in life, I'm just like, and that's where I was relating everything. You just said it like perfectly because you're, you're learning, oh, it's in between and see how your brain goes, I'm relating this to this and this and this and this and this, it's all making sense now. Right. And that's what I, that's what I love when I make these, these self-discoveries and my Seagong passed away. He was 96 years old and mm-hmm. he told both Ben and I, he was like, he was lying on his, on his bed in the hospital and, and he was having moments. He says, I'm still learning even even now, he says, I want you both to keep learning no matter what. Just always know you'll never know everything. Just allow yourself to be open, to have that mind to constantly accept and allow the change of that learning as you as you develop and change and evolve, you're you're constantly learning. And you just used a word that was kind of percolating in the back of my head, allow. And I think that that is such a critical word when you gave that example, the water coming in. And you gave that pause, created a little bit of discomfort. You know, people listening might have heard, and go, did, did they stop talking? Did I lose it? Is there is there something wrong? And then the water goes out. And I think so often in Western culture, the water comes in and immediately goes back out. We push it back out. We're pulling, we're not allowing very much. But there's a point as a martial artist, I suspect, in skating, certainly in acting, and you know, I no formal motorsports training, but, you know, I grew up in an area and live in an area with a lot of dirt roads. So uh, there's, there's, there's some of it, whether you want it to be there or not, <laughs> yeah, where yeah. you have to allow things to happen. If you're jerking the wheel back and forth, if you're forcing things, which is kind of the opposite of allow. Yeah. There are too many factors. It's not all, it's not going to go the way you want it to. Yeah. Yeah. It, and, and to find it is discover where um, in my, my, the the wording my choreographer Ushi Kessler um she competed for Germany back in the 60s and she worked with Brian Orser as well and we had incredible philosophical talks about artistry and art and 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 bringing everything out of creativity and she said you get to the point where it becomes effortless effort Mm. that fluidity that that comes out comes from within um and that effortless effort i i use that a lot and i have to be reminded of it sometimes because i love to i love to work hard i love to work hard but sometimes when you when you work hard all the time sometimes you're you're still forcing and the muscle's still too tight sometimes you just gotta release it a bit and allow allow there's that word again allow it to happen and 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 allowing really is a sense of trust it's trusting your number one, if you've trained for a while, allow the training to do its thing. And that was something like Glenn always taught me. He says, you have to trust your training. It, it, you know, it's like Bruce always said, it's like, I didn't punch the punch happened. You, know, you don't, you don't, you don't think about it. You just do it and it's instinctual. Right. So it's the training and that's that instinct. And then the instinct of, you know, traveling in a car and making the turn or adjusting in traffic as you're racing, because you're never ever barely ever you know unless you're at the front and you start at the front and you're just following your apexes and everything else but your tires are changing every single lap you have to adjust the grip level uh the acting it's again too you're you're adjusting because even you're working with your scene partner there could be something else because you're a living organism the way you're feeling that day is going to be different than the day before when you did the exact same scene. Right. So you don't want to try to emulate what you did yesterday. You want to be in the moment and be who you are now. And that's when you have to trust the moment. And in skating, it, it, it was one of those things where it's a, it's a recital, it's a recital, it's a recital. Yeah, but the magic moments of doing it is doing it and, and creating a moment that is so different than any other moment you've done it. You know, I've done it 152, 300 times during the season, practicing it, training it, or and thousands of times. And then you go to compete. It's not going to be anything like you did when you practiced it. It's going to be better. It's going to have spark because now you have all all this energy put into it. Yeah. Right. Awesome. What does your training look like now? Oh, wow. I, it's, I do so many different things. Like I do a dry land training, uh, mm-hmm. for the racing and for my skating. And it's, um, it's Kung Fu. I still do my Kung Fu with a few other exercises I I've, um, added in. Mm-hmm. 
And I do that a, uh, a couple times a week. And it's, it's an interesting hybrid because it's for skating, it's for racing. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the combination of the two. And it's for just physically being strong to have a balanced body. Kung Fu is great for me. Martial arts has been great because it balances both sides of the body. Skaters tend to get one-sided uh, a lot because we rotate one direction right. And we do, and it, and it can really mess up your, mess up your body uh, with the acting too. It's um, the acting is great because it's, I have to do sometimes a little bit of the opposite of the intensity of the muscles, the tight the explosion where in acting, it's a, it's a training of relaxation, even in scenes that are intense in order for it to be more real. I actually have to relax more. It's mm -hmm. very, it's very oxymoron with that but yeah. um the the training uh that i do even on the if i'm physically skating um i'm very very specific in what i need to do and i don't overdo it so i do what i need to do to get prepped for a show um i push when i need to push you know getting the cart rate up my my lungs was always the weak part in in my thing so i have to work a little harder for that which is mm -hmm. fine so there's a moment where you just got to push and sometimes you hit the wall and you're like, Oh, I got to get through this wall again. You push through it. And then the next day it gets easier and easier and easier. Um, but I, I don't, you know, I'm not training obviously like I did when I was competing because I don't have to do all the big, big quads and stuff like that and, and hard on the body. But there is that, 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 um, that level that I have to be at. Um, of course, the nutrition is, is involved in that too. But I, as I get older, very, very, like even it's crazy to say even more aware but more aware of my body mm -hmm. it's what it's talking to me how do I feel today you know that's what I try to teach the actors I'd wake up every day when I was competing and be like oh, I feel like I'm a pound heavier today and I get on the scale I'd be a pound heavier I could feel when I got on the ice I could tell I was that aware of my body and that is the level that you would need to be at for acting when you want to be the best of the best you got to be aware of your body like ooh. I did this scene yesterday. It's going to be different today. I did, I did an audition yesterday and I felt so weird. It was so off. And I had to play a character that was a little bit stressed. So it played into it, but I felt, I was talking to my wife about it and I was like, it felt so weird. But usually when I have those really weird moments, it means that I'm about to have a breakthrough mm -hmm. in something. So skating, I, my jumps would be off and all this stuff would, would go on. And, and so I had to be aware and not get it freaked out about, you know, and work harder and try to fix it. It was like, allow it to do its process and then be like, Oh, now I get, and then all of a sudden everything comes together again, but you have to trust, mm -hmm. you have to trust you've, that. You've got to step out of your comfort zone. Otherwise yeah. you, if, if you're comfortable, it's going to be the same. Yes. It's going to yeah. be the scene from yesterday. It's going to be the form from yesterday you're not going to perform better. Your times aren't going to be better. You're not going to be more convincing, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think a lot of people, they start into that process and it's scary and it sucks. And they didn't unpack whatever that fear was that held them at, at you know, a, a stopping point and they can't get to that next level. Yeah. And they're, afraid, they're, they're afraid, of the, uh, afraid of the failure and, and not doing it. And I'm like, yeah, but the failure and not achieving is just, a moment in time to teach you what you're where either you're not trusting mm. you're not allowing um it's teaching you one of your weaknesses which actually is important to know what the weakness is because you're then you'll be able to know your strengths so it's not oh i'm i am weak no 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 there's maybe a weakness there and you have to understand it it's not that it's a bad thing it's actually understanding of who you are because you can't be everything so the strengths and weaknesses make make up who you are, and the, the the strength actually balances out the weakness, and it and it's it's an interesting thing. It it just makes us human, and to not take it personally and put it and 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 I think that's the biggest thing um, with uh, sport and not achieving, and then everything is, is having your self worth attached to the outcome of the mm -hmm. event. That's the biggest thing I teach with kids, and that's usually what the demons are there as the moment you're doing it, the failure, uh, the success and all the accolades that could come with it. If it's a big event, like all of these different things that are, that are um, 
that are that are attached. So going back to the original question about training, the you know, big circle, it's really as I got as getting older, is is the awareness heightens that and the spiritual and energetic connection to what I'm doing physically. You know, and that that is I'm always aware of that. And I, I don't just go and do it and kind of eh, I I'm always if I'm setting a time aside to work on a scene, it's very important. It's a very special moment. When I go to work out at the rink and I'm skating, yeah, I play. It's like Bruce always said, it's like serious play. But, you know, I'm, I have a job to do and this is what I'm doing. And I'm, I apply myself. I take responsibility for what I'm doing. And then also for you know, the racing, especially, you know, at those high speeds and everything, you know, warm up and I'm full. When I get in, when I strap the helmet on and I get in the car, it's never rushed. It's always I'm exactly where I need to be. Take my time. Even if I'm late for a session and I wanted to get up there and I'm like, take your time, take the breath. Okay. Now I'm ready to go. It's, and, and I use that. We use that in acting. I, at I work with the students. They, sometimes they start, I'm like, you know, stop, start again. You're, you got to go when it's kind of like you're about to step in a double Dutch, mm. in a double Dutch with the, the skipping yeah. and you just jump in and you get hit. Instead of wait, your body moves with the, you see the double Dutch when they're about to go in and then, then there's a rhythm then then, exactly. And it's an internal rhythm of when to start. And that's really important. And your rhythm could be off, you know, and I've done it skating, uh, Kung Fu, uh, acting, racing, rhythm, rhythm starts with the breath coming in, wait breath going out and again forcing it allow that rhythm and you have to learn your rhythm learn you Hmm. as someone who i'm going to use a word you didn't you know just seems hell-bent on performing at the highest level in anything that you do you talked about wanting to be successful is there anything you're working on now that you're not quite there yet is there, you know, you've talked about these kind of four pursuits of yours. Is there a fifth? Is there something that you're you're looking at and you're like, you know, kind of timing that rhythm? I, I, I might want to try that. Um, the racing in cars, because I went from carts to cars. Um, yeah. I'm at that point where I'm like, I see that, th- like, I look at the amount of work I have to do, the the learning curve and the, the information that I need, because I, I know what it takes to be successful at something. I'm looking at it going, there's lots to be done. It's daunting. Mm. And I go, Ooh, it's challenging because there's people that'll say, well, you're a figure skater. I got, I got picked on when I started karting. You never, they, they make jokes, you know, and, and I make jokes too. I tell them, you know, you just got beat by a guy that wears spandex for a living, you know, that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so and I, and I threw it back to them and, you know, and a year later I was second in Canada, you know, um, in my division. So it, it, they're they're still like i'm all i'm always learning and and um you know eventually my skating i'm gonna i've done it for so long it's i need to put that to rest and i just i want to do my uh i'll always do my kung fu because i it's in that's in me mm-hmm. and even the skating it's in me but the kung fu the training is is a is a something that is there you know just simply doing horse stance and just working horse you know strong horse strong punch that's that was the philosophy from the beginning that that my seagull taught me and, and it was strong horse, strong punch. And that base, uh, you know, some kids asked, you know, what can I do while you're away? You know, and I'm like, Hey, just work on your horse, just work on horse. I'm telling you just work on horse. It, it, it every, every style has a horse stance and it's there. And I said, it's, a, there's a reason for it. There's a, and it's thousands of years old. There's a reason for it. It's energetically connected to the planet in a way and grounds us. And I use that in my, I use that in my acting and, and I, I see in, in the racing, I'm so inspired by it. something I've wanted to since I was a, a kid. And so I'm, I'm looking at it going, yeah, this is an awesome challenge. I want to, I want to go for it. I love learning to discover and see how quickly I can learn this, discover something about myself experience. I, I love the experience of being at the peak of a certain technique to, to be at its, you know, shaving off the the little nuances beyond being on point that's Mm -hmm. what i love 
and and you because you ask you know you see that whatever i love doing i'm just i'd like to be on point yeah. and it, sometimes sometimes i had to use it was in me i hated losing more than i loved winning because it's like yeah i won okay great and i understand i learned but when it when i when i lost or failed i'm like oh, what was it and that that's is where the lessons are that's where it all is exactly that's where it all is and it's that's what fueled me and and because I would say, what's your philosophy and what? And like, I hated losing more than I loved winning. Not the first time we've heard that on this show. <laughs> I'm it, sure. There is, it is a common thread yeah. among high, high performers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Awesome. Well, if people want to find you, follow you, where where would they go? Yeah, I to make life simple, uh, my wife does uh, my social media. We just kind of scale down to Instagram. Mm -hmm. So on Instagram, it's uh, Elvis Stoiko, but it's only one S. <laughs> so it's E-L-V-I-S-T-O-J-K-O. Oh. Yeah. So if you put in Elvis and then Stoiko at Elvis, so you, it, it, there's, there's a bunch of fan, fan sites, but okay. fan accounts. So just L, so it's at Elvis and then T-O-J-K-O. So the S kind of blends over. But double duty. Um, yeah. And then you can find all the stuff there. Um, uh, racing and uh, there's some of my acting stuff, some skating stuff. There's a lot of racing right now because I'm focused on that. I'm racing uh, this weekend and I'm, I'm really focused on, on that part of it. But uh, yeah, it's, it, it's um, yeah, it, it's just been an incredible journey as I still continue this. And um, I'm just thankful that, uh, you know, getting, getting out there to do my thing and, and I'm healthy and, and uh, you know, I just turned 50 this year and I'm still, kicking and doing my thing and i feel great um and thank you so much for having me on the show this is uh it's been great it such such great questions thank you. i loved it because it, it's thank one you. of those great questions where it just i end up going off on a tangent i tend to do that that's, sometimes that's my job that's <laughs> my I, I, t I tell i tell guests all the time my job is just to keep you talking the audience yeah. they've heard they've heard me for years <laughs> they don't care about me they care about you so i'm gonna ask, actually ask you one more question as as we wind up here what are your final words to the audience? How do you want to leave this? Oh man. Um, another great question. I think um, through all the craziness that happens in this world that, that we've gone through, especially with COVID and everything else is finding your true path and not, and not, following what because it, it like with social media there's so many things out there and you can get caught up in this person doing that and this person doing that and following you know these things is follow your own path and I was successful because I showed my true colors in skating where skating um didn't want me because I was so different and I put skating on its head when I did the martial art program in 1994 uh, my honor my instructor my seagong uh, Bruce Lee um, you know, the Kung Fu. And I had so many martial artists write me after saying, thank you for doing that because um, we could tell you were a martial artist. You weren't a skater doing martial arts moves. And when, uh, I'll share the story with you. And it was uh, right after I competed in Lillehammer and the chef de Michel said, Elvis, there's someone that wants to meet you. And I'm like, oh, he's on the other side. I'm not going to tell you who it is. And uh, it was during the time of the Nancy Kerrigan, Tanya Harding mm. fiasco, that whole yeah. thing. So a lot of people came to watch the event in Lillehammer. Come across, he pulls me to the other side of the rink and the ladies event is on and I go down and it's Chuck Norris. And Chuck, he, he puts out his hand, he goes, I saw your performance at home and I want to thank you for honoring my friend. Mm. And I sat with him for like an hour and we talked about skating, talking about martial arts. And I was able to meet um uh, Linda Lee and she sent me a whole mm -hmm. bunch of stuff from Bruce and and of course uh, it was it was such an incredible incredible time and that all of that even though I didn't win a gold that was my gold medal that I that people remember that program because it was unique and to this day it still stands the test of time it was something that happened through me it's I always feel I, did, I didn't do it it happened through me it was meant to happen and and it was the, again it was the effortless effort and I remember competing it came out so so easy it flowed and it it to this day it still like I said it stands the test of time because I showed who I was and didn't care what people thought I just expressed and expressed 
in a medium that allowed me to be me completely free. And I used to, we used to talk about this with Ushi. Ushi, we used to say this to you, just skate free. So for me, it's about living free. So going back to the original question, living free and seeing yourself like that. I live free in my, my acting. I live free in my racing. I live free in everything that I do. And I think that that's, for me, is just being, being free to be who you are and express who you are, unabashed, um, unapologetic, uh, and just be, and be who you are. And I think that's, that is uh, the message I would want to pass on to everybody. I hope you enjoyed that episode as much as I enjoyed doing it. I don't know what to say. I, we just, we covered so much ground. How do I, how do I sum this one up? I, I'm not even going to try. If you dug it, you dug it. If you stuck around this long, you probably did. Elvis, thanks for coming on. I, I, I'm i honored and appreciate your time. Listeners, viewers, thank you. Thank you for sticking around. Thanks for paying attention to the things that we do. And if those mean something to you, please consider supporting us so we can continue bringing you great stuff. We've got a Patreon. You can grab a book on Amazon. There's so many things you can do. To those of you who do, thank you. If you want to have me come to your school, teach a seminar, you have other feedback for us, a guest suggestion, a topic suggestion, don't be afraid to reach out. Jeremy at whistlekick.com. Our social media, it's at whistlekick everywhere you might think of. And that takes us to the end. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.